So in this video, I'm going to show you that functions which are monotone over the closed interval that you want to integrate over, they are always Riemann integrable over that interval. Like the fact that functions that are continuous over the closed interval everywhere are always Riemann integrable over that interval. And this holds true for both monotonically increasing functions and monotonically decreasing functions. And we're going to prove that in this video. We're going to do it using the Riemann integrability criterion, so we'll show that these functions which are monotone over the entire interval are indeed always going to satisfy the integrability criterion. We'll start with monotonically increasing functions and then we'll do monotonically decreasing functions. The argument is basically exactly the same, just with small alterations. Before we begin, let me just say something about notation. So in my previous videos on Riemann integration, I've been talking about dissections as opposed to partitions. They are exactly the same concept. However, I'm going to actually change over to talking about partitions instead of dissections, just because actually this notation, this way of doing things is, I think, more widespread. So I want to try and adapt to the most conventional way of doing it. So I'm going to stop writing D and instead write P for partition, but it's exactly the same concept. It's just referring to the way in which we are breaking up our interval over which we are integrating when we are considering an upper Riemann sum or a lower Riemann sum. I'm also going to actually change the way I write upper and lower sums to this. So this is going to be the upper Riemann sum of our function f using the partition p. So I'm going to denote it like so, u bracket f, and then we've got a semicolon there, p, and then close bracket. And this is how I'm going to denote the lower Riemann sum of the function f where we're using the partition p. So if you've been following the playlist along, hopefully you won't be too angry with me for this. I think this is a good change because I think this notation, you're far more likely to see this if you read textbooks or if you watch other people's YouTube videos about upper Riemann sums and lower Riemann sums and Riemann integration. So let's begin. So let's say that we have got a monotonically increasing function f defined on the interval a, b, and this is the interval over which we're going to integrate it, and it's a real valued function, of course, and what this statement here is doing is capturing formally the fact that this function is monotonically increasing, or capturing formally what I even mean by monotonically increasing. So it means that if you take any two points in the interval a, b, x1 and x2 are the what we're going to call these two points, and one of them is going to be greater than or equal to the other. You might, if you're picking two points randomly from that interval, happen to pick the two same points, in which case they'll be equal to one another. If you get two different ones, one will be bigger than the other. Let's call x2 the one that has the chance of being bigger than the other. So x1 is going to be less than or equal to x2, and this is going to imply this if the function is monotonically increasing. This is what it means for the function to be monotonically increasing. That if x2 is greater than or equal to x1, then if you look at what they're being mapped onto, f of x1 and f of x2, because x2 is further along in the domain than x1, the value that it's mapped onto is going to be greater than or equal to the value that x1 is mapped onto. So f of x1 is going to be less than or equal to f of x2. This is what it means for the function to be monotonically increasing. So a picture is quite helpful for this concept. So here is our interval a, b, and here is what the function is mapping each of the points in the interval onto. And Monotonically increasing means that as you go along this way, as you increase in the domain, the value that you're being mapped onto by the function either stays the same, it stays constant, or it goes up, it never goes down. Note that if we call the function strictly increasing, that's a stronger criterion. That means that as you go up, the function has to go up. It can't stay level, it has to go up. But monotonically increasing is slightly weaker than that. It says that the function can either stay the same or it can go up, but it never goes down. So that's what I've drawn here. You can see that at some bits, it looks as though the function's level and is staying the same. Maybe even at this right starting bit, it's staying the same, but then it starts to go up and then it continues going up. And then here again, 
it seems to level off and stay the same, but at no point does it go down. Uh, so this is not supposed, this picture isn't supposed to have it anywhere where it goes down. It does, the way I've drawn it, maybe it looks as though it slightly is going down here, but that's not what it's supposed to show. It's supposed to show it just leveling off and staying the same there. So that's pictorially what a monotonically increasing function means. As you go along in the domain, you either stay the same or you go up, but you never go down. So we want our function to be monotonically increasing, to obey this criterion on every single point on this closed interval from A to B. And if that is the case, we are going to show that this function is absolutely always Riemann integrable. You don't need to know anything more about it. You can conclude that it is Riemann integrable. And we're going to do that by showing it obeys the integrability criterion. Now, firstly, let me just point out that if it is monotonically increasing everywhere on this closed bounded interval, then we can immediately conclude that the function is bounded. The reason is that you can go to these two end points. You go to the point A and you ask, what is it being mapped onto, f of A? And you go onto this end point, the top end point, and you ask, what is it being mapped onto, f of B? And because it's monotonically increasing, you can conclude that if you take any point inside this interval, A, B, that the value it's being mapped onto is always going to be less than or equal to what B, the upper end point, is being mapped onto, and it's always going to be greater than or equal to what the end point A is being mapped onto, so it's always going to be greater than or equal to F A. So this is a upper bound for everything um, that the function is mapping you onto in for this interval, and this is a lower bound for the function over that interval. So you might worry when you initially see this theorem that we're about to prove that monotonically increasing functions are always Riemann integrable. You might worry and think, well, surely I could create a monotonically increasing function that is unbounded, and therefore that wouldn't be Riemann integrable. But you can't. The reason you can't is because I'm insisting that it's monotonically increasing everywhere on this closed, bounded interval, and that's the problem. Because it has to obey this criterion even on the end points of that closed bounded interval. So A has to be mapped onto some finite value, some real number by the function, and B also has to be mapped onto some finite real number by the function. And then because of this monotonic, the increasing criterion, which applies even for the end points, I can then conclude that any other point in fact, any point indeed in this interval, even if you pick one of the endpoints, is always going to obey this inequality because of this. So you don't have to worry about the possibility of there being these unbounded, monotonically increasing functions that are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. You could define those if we had an open interval, A, B, and it was uh, the function was monotonically increasing on the open interval, everywhere on the open interval. That, you could imagine, uh, the problem arising. But because we're insisting on those end points, the criterion, the monotonically increasing criterion, also being true for those two end points, that stops those horrible problems from arising because of the fact that you always have to have a value for the function at those two end points. Uh, and those are going to bound then everything in between. So the proof then now, so we have our monotonically increasing function on this closed bounded interval, and we want to show that it's always Riemann integrable by showing that it obeys the Riemann integrability criterion. So we want to be able to show that by picking better and better partitions, we can make the upper, the difference between the upper and lower Riemann sums indefinitely small. So the partitions that we're going to work with are going to be the really simple partitions where we break this interval a, b up into n equal pieces, where n is some natural number, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, etc., counting numbers. So this is what part the partition is going to look like. So uh, again, it's what we were previously calling a dissection, so this finite sequence of places where we've cut the interval. So we've got a... And then the whole interval is of length b minus a. We're fragmenting it up into n pieces when we're considering the partition pn. So this is, these are our general partitions. You substitute in whichever natural number you're considering. Um, and then we've got 
a to a plus b minus a over n, then the next one's going to be a plus 2 b minus a over n, and then you're going to continue on all the way up to a plus n over n times b minus a. And of course, you can see the n's cancel, and then the minus a cancels with the a here, and that will be your point b. So this is the partition that we're going to work with, which is fragmenting this interval up into n pieces. So it's a general partition. You substitute in whichever n you're considering here. So let's now consider what the upper Riemann sum for our function over one of these partitions, Pn, is going to be. And the formula that I've got here is going to apply for all of them, no matter what n you pick. So it's a general formula that works for all of them. So uh, n is a natural number. So we're going to sum from i is equal to 1 to whatever n is. So this is going to be the sum over all of these subintervals. And then you're going to want the length of each of the subintervals, which is going to be b minus a over n, and then you want to times it by the supremum of the value of the function over each of the subintervals. So as we go from 1 to m, we're going over each one of the subintervals, and we want to put here the supremum of the value of the function over that subinterval. Now the supremum is actually really simple because of the fact that this function is monotonically increasing. So if you, for example, go to this first subinterval, the function actually has a maximum over the subinterval. You don't have to worry about it only having a supremum and not actually having a maximum. It actually has a maximum. And that maximum is going to be the value of the function at the upper bound of the subinterval. So that is going to be the maximum value that the function obtains, and that will then be the supremum. When you have a maximum, the maximum is the supremum. It's an upper bound for everything, and of course it's the least upper bound, because if you go any smaller, then you're going to be smaller than that maximal value, and therefore you're not going to be an upper bound. So the thing that we need here then is just the value of the function at the upper bound of each subinterval. So if you take i is equal to 1 in this sum, you've got the length of that first subinterval, that's fine, and then you want the value of the function here, which is going to be f at a plus b minus a over n, and you want 1 here, and you can see I've put an i there, so when i is equal to 1, that's all working out nicely, so this first term in this series I'm happy with or this sum, I'm happy with. Uh, series, you should usually refrain from using that word and just use that for infinite sums. So I should say sum, not series. Um, so then let's go on to the second uh, subinterval of my sum here. So i is equal to 2 now. So again, the length of the subinterval is b minus a over n. That's fine. And then the supremum of the function over that subinterval, again, each of these subintervals, all n of them, the value of the function over that has a maximum, and the maximum is obtained at the upper end of the subinterval, at the upper bound of the subinterval. So for the second subinterval, I just want the value of the function here, which of course is going to be f at a plus 2 times b minus a over n. So you can see the i here is working again. And indeed, this formula that I've put here is going to work for all of them. If you go all the way on to the final subinterval, the nth subinterval, then put i is equal to n here, the n's cancel, you then can see that the minus a cancels with the a here, and you just end up with f of b, which is correct, because b is the um, upper bound for that final subinterval. Um, so f of b is going to be the maximum the function obtains over that subinterval, and therefore it's going to be the supremum. So this, hopefully you agree, this is the value of the upper Riemann sum for the function over one of these partitions, Pn, and it's a nice formula because it works for all n. It's a nice general formula. It holds for all of them. Now let's consider the lower Riemann sum for our function over one of these partitions, Pn, and again we want a formula for this that works for a general n. So again it's going to be the sum over all the subintervals, so sum from i is equal to 1 to n, for all n subintervals, and you want the length of the subinterval, which is always going to be b minus a over n. And then now what we want is the infimum of the function over each of the subintervals. Now again, because it's monotonically increasing, this is really simple. The function has a minimum, and that minimum is at the lower bound of the subinterval, 
rather than the upper bound this time. So the maximum is at the upper bound, the minimum is at the lower bound. And then the minimum, of course, when you have a minimum, that's fantastic. Uh, the minimum is always going to be the infimum because it's going to be a lower bound for everything. And of course, it's going to be the greatest lower bound because if you go any bigger, then you're going to be bigger than that minimum value. So you're not going to be a lower bound anymore. So the value of the function at the lower bounds of the subintervals is the thing that we need here in the lower Riemann sums. So it's similar sort of formula here. So we've got f at a plus, but now I've put i minus 1 times b minus a over n. And let's just check that this works. So let's start with the first subinterval. Um, so i is equal to 1. And you can see that here, the you put in 1 here and you get 0. So all of this goes and you just get f at a. So you're got the function evaluated at a, and that is indeed the minimum of the function over that first subinterval. And then when you go i is equal to 2, you get 2 minus 1, which is 1 here, so you can see that you'll get the value of the function there, and that is indeed the lower bound for the second subinterval. It was the upper bound for the first subinterval, but it's the lower bound for the second subinterval. And then if you go all the way up to i is equal to n, you'll still have the length of the subinterval here, and then you'll have f evaluated at a plus m minus 1 times b minus a over n. And of course, that is f evaluated at this point here, the penultimate point, uh, the penultimate cut in the partition uh, before the final um, upper bound, which is b. And that will indeed be the infimum of the function over that final subinterval. So this formula that we've got here is working.